Hi. My name is Arthur, and I'm a Californian. I used to work as a ranger at Sequoia National Park from 1994 to 1997. Before I start, I just want to say that I'm crying as I write this because the memories are extremely traumatic. It happened in 1997 in my last year working as a ranger. It was also this event that got me fired. I was patrolling an area that was not very frequented by visitors because of the density of the bushes and because it was an easy area to get lost. I had received a report of loud sounds coming from there, sounds that were scaring the visitors, making them think there was a bear on the loose or something. It was noon and I was driving around the area with a jeep and a tranquilizer rifle just in case something was really there. I spent one hour driving around and I stopped the jeep, exited it, and was standing by the open door. I was about to pick up my walkie-talkie and report the situation to one of the other rangers that were patrolling the other side when I heard something on my left, a loud growl. I looked and there was a big reddish-brown thing with wide shoulders, long arms, and huge human hands looking at me. This part really breaks me every time I remember it because I got paralyzed in fear at the moment because this thing was bigger than any grizzly bear and was glaring at me with a face that I can only describe as a hungry predator. I felt like an ambushed prey. I stood there and this thing charged at me with full force and I entered the jeep almost instantly. The creature crashed into the jeep breaking the door's window and the thing grunted in pain. I turned the jeep on and accelerated beyond the speed limit of the park. I looked behind for a second and this monster was running after the jeep on all fours, just like a chimp. I panicked even more and I increased the speed and some curves later I finally lost him. I arrived at the ranger station and there was nobody there. I remember being so panicked that I locked myself inside a bathroom and I'm certain that I fainted because I remember that everything went black. When I woke up, it was 9 p.m. and the other rangers were looking for me. My boss confronted me about the jeep having one of the sides damaged with the broken window, and when I told him that a big animal attacked me, he got angry at me, called me a liar who sleeps on the job, and accused me of crashing the jeep on a tree and making stories up to not to get in trouble and fired me. I did years and years of therapy and it didn't work. The memories still haunt me and I still have nightmares and sudden panic attacks. I know the thing that tried to snatch me was a Bigfoot and not a bear. Bears don't have human faces, human hands and wide shoulders, and they don't have freakishly long limbs. I lived with these memories for more than 20 years, and this is my first time telling this story ever since. Thank you for reading this. It was the beginning of archery hunting season for elk, four years ago in August. My friend Richard and I, accompanied by our buddy John, embarked on an adventure to Black Bear Swamp. Little did we know that this outing would unveil a sight that would haunt our memories for years to come. As the sun began its descent, casting a golden glow upon the landscape, we found ourselves near a road at around 7 p.m. It was then that our eyes caught something peculiar. A creature stood perched upon a hill, its figure shrouded in shadows. Its hue appeared to be a murky brown, blending seamlessly with the surroundings. The sheer magnitude of this being left us in awe a towering presence that seemed to reach heights of approximately 12 feet. The image of that encounter still lingers vividly in my mind as I recall the conversation I had with Richard over the phone on August 18th. He described the creature, the words tumbling out in a mix of fascination and trepidation. The mere thought of it sent a shiver down my spine, a reminder of the enigmatic encounter we had experienced together. To this day, the details remain etched in our memories, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that lie within the depths of the world we inhabit. The shadowy figure, the towering height, and the haunting presence of that creature on the hill continue to fuel our curiosity, leaving us yearning for answers that may forever elude us. Four years have passed since that fateful day, and yet the impact of that sighting has not diminished. It serves as a testament to the hidden wonders that exist in the realms beyond our comprehension. Our encounter with the mysterious creature at Black Bear Swamp is a chapter of our lives that will forever intrigue and haunt us.
a fragment of the unknown that forever remains embedded in our shared experiences. Marie in Minneapolis made two separate phone calls, first to Coast to Coast, and then to Darkness Radio looking for answers regarding something that happened to her the night after Halloween 2014 while doing her paper route. The event clearly disturbed her, and she couldn't explain it, nor could any of the hosts or guests of the various radio shows. This happened the night after Halloween. I deliver newspapers at night, and I was delivering newspapers that night, and it was business as usual. I rounded this curve, and I saw a group of kids in the middle of the road. There were about six of them, and they were all wearing gray robes with hoods. They didn't have the hoods on, they were down their backs. I thought that was kind of strange because Halloween had ended about 10 hours before that. One of them saw me and started walking very quickly towards my car saying something. She got very close to my car and I could see that she was about 15 years old and my first thought was, why was she out there? That's pretty young to be out there at that time of night. It was about 4.30 in the morning. I didn't have time to talk to her so I drove around her. But then there were the other five kids in the middle of the road, and then they saw me and they fanned out to surround my car so I couldn't move, and that scared me. I drove up on the lawn to get around them, but they were coming pretty quickly at my car, and I almost hit one of them, and then I thought, I'm going to call the police because this is quite odd. Then I thought, I better follow them so I could tell the police what they're doing. I saw them turn down this street and I turned to follow them and it took about 10 seconds to get to this street and they were gone. They had disappeared and there's no way they could have gone to even the first house. I've been sailing all my life and have somewhere around 6,000 sea miles as well as years and years of inland dinghy racing experience. The sea just does strange things sometimes. Wind against tide and underwater obstacles causing weird currents create unnatural waves, and it starts to feel like the sea is just throwing water at you at random. Fog at sea at night really mess up your senses too. Everything is quiet and you can't see anything but the boat immediately around you. You keep looking for lights on other ships and listening for fog horns or the sound of engines in the distance and your brain starts playing all manner of tricks on you. In a busy shipping lane, it's a serious business, and in a very real way it could be life or death if you miss a ship that hits you and sinks you. You start to see lights everywhere around you. You start hearing engines creeping up on you. You stop your boat and cut the engine to see if you're hearing anything real, and you enter an even stranger world of sensory deprivation. It's eerie as hell. Second edit to add this one I've just remembered. A full solar eclipse. We saw one in the middle of the English Channel, and it was the strangest thing. There was thin cloud, but the sun was visible through it. We were within the total eclipse zone and could see the shadow coming from miles away. It looked like the biggest, most angry storm I've ever seen. Generally, the darker the clouds, the more it's going to hurt. This was a darkness as dark as is possible at sea during the day talked to my dad about it afterwards, and we both felt a real uneasiness getting worse and worse the nearer it got. Our bodies and subconscious were readying us for dealing with a really shitty dangerous situation. It was just like how people sometimes describe sending a ghost. A cold chill and feeling really on edge. It really was like a ghost storm. A lot of sailing becomes instinctual after a while and you get a feeling about what's coming from watching the clouds and waves off on the horizon. The eclipse gave off every sign of absolute nastiness, but passed without any real-world effect other than darkness. Really creepy. One time we were camping and were talking with one of the locals we came across that lived in the mountains Appalachian Mountains. He eventually talks us into going down a back gravel road to show us some more of the land. He drives us down this back gravel road and eventually turns off onto a small hill and goes back through a path into a small corner in the woods. There is a group of people in old vans with doors open, propane tanks, and other random non-camping equipment. 
He cuts the engine and a big dude with a scraggly beard starts slowly walking up to us. At this point we immediately knew they were cooking and gave each other the we need to get the F out of here look. The bearded man starts talking to our driver and arguing about money a bit and then ends the convo. Driver starts up the truck, turns around and we leave. I felt like I was in the hills have eyes or deliverance. Kinda different story but nonetheless creepy and thought we were going to die. I walked into a pot growing operation outside Santa Cruz, California. Took a minute to figure out why there was black tubing running everywhere. Got the F out of there in a hurry. Also had a close encounter with a bear in Colorado. I was visiting and not used to the elevation. If I had had to run, I would have been the easiest meal that bear ever had. I also stumbled into an abandoned homeless camp in a pretty suburban part of Virginia. Except that it wasn't abandoned after all. Saw seven or eight guys standing back in the woods staring at me. Backed up the way I came in. None of them ever moved. No one said a word. Weird thing is that they were all dressed exactly alike. Brown jackets, green pants. Now for the final story. There's one encounter that really stands out though. I was day hiking the ridges above Raton, New Mexico. I'd been out quite a while when I came across a well-picked over deer carcass. There weren't any fresh tracks around it, but that's a real clear indication that I'm on some large predator's home turf. Time to go. As I'm climbing down off the ridge not the way I came up, I see a flat area with an odd round stone formation. Think Stonehenge, but the rocks aren't squared off. Each of rocks are all taller than I am, and formed a darn near perfect circle. I'm a little creeped out, but I step in for a closer look. The second I crossed through the rocks, it was like an electric shock. Immediate goosebumps, the hair on my neck is standing up, and every nerve in my body is screaming at me to be somewhere else right now. I scrambled down the rest of that ridge way out of control. I was lucky not to hurt myself cause at some points I was just jumping without looking where I was going to put my feet. I did not look back once. Twenty years on, I still cannot explain my reaction. I'm not given to extreme flights of fancy. I'm not afraid of things that go bump in the night. I'm not a religious person and I don't believe in evil with a capital E. But I did that day. Something horrific happened there once, and it will happen again. This occurred around 1999-2000. My best friend and I were avid outdoor adventurers and amateur pot growers. We would frequently find secluded places in the woods that allowed for ample light and shade for plants to grow, and that would not allow them to be easily found. One particular day we went to an annex of trails located near a NJ State Park trail system. The trails weren't in the park, but I had hiked them before and knew they weren't that frequented. We had gone out that day with our seeds partially sprouted in moist paper towels. We parked the car at the trailhead and started hiking in. We covered a mile or so and then ventured off the trail and into the woods. We found a clearing, planted the seeds, and tied a few barely visible ribbons off to mark the way to the plant spot to check them in the future. My friend and I got back on the trail and started walking back to, to the car, when my friend noticed a man in the other direction just staring at us. He was probably in his 30s or 40s, bald head, normal clothes. We didn't think anything of it for the most part but we definitely kept looking back as anyone would when someone is behind them in the woods. We saw that he was walking 60 plus or so feet behind us. It seemed weird, but it was probably more so due to us having anxiety that we planted seeds. We picked up the pace, but the man also seemed to pick up the pace as we weren't gaining any distance. At one point we decided to just get off the trail and let him pass. We turned off the trail and walked into a thicket of sticker bushes, which I remember vividly getting shredded on. We got deeper into the woods and heard cursing. When we turned around the man was coming through where we entered. It was at that moment we actually became scared. Mind you were two young strong 19 year olds, but a man following you into the woods is damn creepy. 
We made kind of a U maneuver to outflank him and came out of the woods a bit further down trail. Once on the trail, we ran. As we were running, there was a fork in the trail and my friend went right and I left. I realized my mistake as my buddy was going down the correct path and I wasn't. So I turned around and started running back towards the fork to follow my friend. As I was running towards the direction we came from to get to the fork, I could see the man running towards me down the trail. He was a distance away, but not far enough in my eyes. Survival mode kicked in and I ran as hard as I could. I caught up to my friend who was waking at that point. I screamed he's after us and we both booked it to all the way to the car. We got in the car shaking and out of breath. We backed up and started to get out of the parking lot when the man appeared at the trailhead. He stopped there and just stared at us as we drove away. I always wonder what that was all about. Did he want to kill a couple of 19-year-olds? Was he also doing something illegal in those woods and wanted us gone? My buddy and I still laugh and talk about that day 22 years ago. When I was 12, I spent an entire summer in my grandparents' village. The village is small, and we all know each other, but it's quite rural and surrounded by hills and woods. At that time, my occupation was collecting herbs and all kind of insects, so I went on a little adventure with my dog. I packed water, snacks, and went into the woods. I had a great time for quite a few hours. I found so many interesting bugs and plants, but suddenly I heard some commotion. It felt strange, but being a dumb and naive kid, I thought nothing of it and kept going, but my dog Caucasian Shepherd started growling and barking. At first I thought that she barked at some animal, but there was nothing there. I called her a couple of times, but she just kept growling, and that's when I saw a man standing between two trees. That man wasn't from the village, and he looked so strange he was skinny. He had something red, I assume blood on his shirt. His eyes were open wide, and he just stared at me. I froze in fear, couldn't move or run. I just stood there unable to do anything, my dog still barking and growling. Everything changed when man smiled. I never felt that uneasiness ever in my life. His teeth were rotten, some of them missing. It was so scary seeing him smiling. It wasn't a ghost or vampire, but still he looked hella creepy. I called my dog, she whined, and suddenly we were running trying to get the hell away from that woods and that man. When we came home, I couldn't stop shaking, and after that I never went out there again. This was a really long time ago, but I always feel uneasy and scared when where I remember this. I'm so glad I found this subreddit because I love remembering this story. It's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. Also, I'm not great with words or typing things out, so sorry about that. This was in ninth grade. There was this huge state park right outside of the town I lived in. My friend and I would go down the trails every now and then. We had been walking for maybe 10 minutes when we realized there was an older woman not far behind us. I only really noticed because of how out of place she looked. Like she came straight out of an old folks home and was just dropped in the woods. We were joking around about how creepy she was and sped up to put some distance between us. But every time we did, we'd look back and still be able to spot her. We did that probably three times. We still thought it was funny though. We ended up running down the trail until we got to a small bridge. We hopped off the bridge into a creek and then went around a bend. We could still see the bridge from where we were. We were cracking up about the whole thing when we saw the old lady again. We had run for a good couple of minutes, like she shouldn't have caught up that fast. And it was like she knew we got off the trail because she was just standing on the bridge looking around. I think that's when we stopped thinking it was funny. As soon as she left, we took off running the other way. That was it though. Nothing happened. I just always thought the whole thing was creepy. A military man, John, went outside to have a smoke. He lives in the hills surrounding Deadwood, South Dakota. He spotted two kids walking up a hill. They stopped and looked at John, which spooked him. They were wearing hoodies and looked very strange. 
Their eyes were completely black. They started to come across the street walking directly towards John, who introduced himself to them. They continued to advance towards him. Frightened, he retreated into the house. Inside, he asked his wife if she heard him talking to the kids. She never heard anything. They soon went to bed. John then noticed one of the boys outside his window. He rushed to bolt the front door, as one of them was there too. He never made it to the door. For whatever reason, he turned around and went back to the bedroom, where he saw the boy standing outside his window. He went to grab his pistol. He wanted to scare them off. He assumed they were wearing masks. One was at the window and another was at the door. He was extremely scared now. The next thing he remembered was waking up in bed. His wife informed him that he had been gone for an hour and a half. I did hear the door open and close. You weren't there, she told him. John had left the house at 4 a.m. and didn't return home until 5.30 a.m. A friend of mine known as Damo was an avid fisherman, and he and his dad used to go out sea fishing whenever they could. A few years ago, he told me this story, and it creeped the hell of me, so this seems like an appropriate place to tell it. Damo and his dad were on the second night of a trip deep sea fishing, and they decided to get some sleep in the early evening so they could go for whatever fish they were after at around 1 a.m., the best time to get this fish, apparently. Anyway, they only had a small-ish boat, but the weather was extremely pleasant and the sea was calm to the point of stillness, so they figured it would be a great night's fishing for them. Around 12.30 a.m., they started to set their gear up, and as they were on the starboard side getting bait ready, they heard a loud splash on the port side. As there was almost no swell, they figured it was either a large fish or some gear had somehow fallen in, so they went over to have a look. Floating face up in the water only a few feet from the side of the boat was a young woman. They reckoned she couldn't have been more than about 30 at the most. She showed absolutely no signs of decomposition bloating, and there was nothing tangled in her hair, all of which would normally suggest she had been in the water for some time. She was wearing a simple white skirt and a blue-colored strappy top, both of which were clean and apparently looked barely wet again, all indicating she had only just gone in the water. She showed no signs of damage like having been beaten or attacked and her eyes and mouth were shut. Damo said she looked totally peaceful and like she was simply asleep and just floating on her back in the water. They were both totally freaked out by the whole thing, but reacting more to the need to make sure she was okay instead of just standing there trying to work out where she came from they tried to wake her up shouting to her etc. And they threw a line to her hoping they may catch her enough to pull he back in. She showed no signs of movement, and the splashing around they were making with the rope served only to let her body drift further away from the boat. When she was a few meters away, Damo ran off to grab a fishing rod, hoping they could pull her in that way, and his dad ran to the cabin to try and call a coast guard for help. When Damo got back to the side, she had vanished. He frantically searched around and splashed into the water with the rod, thinking she had bobbed underwater, or even drifted under the boat somehow, but the body had vanished. Eventually his dad, figuring they couldn't just leave a potential dead or unconscious body floating in the water, jumped in and swam over to where she had last been, hoping he may find her under the surface, but they couldn't find anything. They did eventually drive the boat around in a good half kilometer circle, but they never saw the body again. The Coast Guard did come out and obviously Damo and his dad were kind of interrogated to make sure they hadn't murdered dumped the body but nothing came of it all. The freakiest thing about it all was that the boat was thoroughly checked before they had set out fishing the day before so they could say with certainty that there had been no woman on board when they set off either a dead body or a stowaway homeless woman. The apparently fresh state of the body kind of removed the possibility that she had been in the water a while and that they just found the body and they were far enough out from land and nowhere near any other boats that her appearance there was just totally unexplainable, as was the way the body just disappeared. Damo and his dad hadn't been gone more than 20 seconds from the side of the boat, but in that time the body just vanished. 
They were both really shaken by the whole thing and were most terrified by the fact that her appearance was preceded by the heavy splash in the water, to them suggesting the body had only just entered the water from their own boat. They tell the story now as a kind of, you won't believe what happened to us once type thing, but it shook them badly and neither has been back to the same fishing spot since. Sorry it's a long one, but it's so creepy it felt like it deserved to be explained fully. My sons, then about seven and five, and I had planned to fish the Brighton Bush River near the 46 and 85 bridge as we'd camped in the area before, and they were familiar with it. We turned off FR 46 onto 4685 South, crossed the bridge, pulled over and parked. 4685 continues on a short way, then begins to climb. There's a dirt road that leads right west that parallels the river immediately past where we parked. I was giving the OK, here's how we're going to do this. Speech when a movement a little farther up the road, 100 feet or so, caught my attention. When I looked I saw a figure I entirely thought to be a person walking across the road from left to right, but quickly realized this was out of the ordinary. The figure was approximately 8 feet tall, maybe a few inches more, covered with reddish-brown hair all over its body. I distinctly remember seeing muscle movement as it moved and thinking, man, that thing must be strong. I also remember its arms swinging as it walked, and being too long for a human being's because its hands came down to its lower thigh level. It only had to take four or five steps to cross the road, then step down over the edge of the road into the brush. It turned and looked at us briefly as it walked. I can't honestly say I got a good look at its facial features, but I did notice that the hair color on the head and the side of the face matched the color of the body hair. When I looked at my boys, my older son was staring where I had been my younger son didn't see it. After the shock of did we just see a Bigfoot, past I walked up to where the figure had walked across the road and tried to duplicate its stride. I'm five feet nine and it took me several steps to cross the road. I went into the brush where I saw it enter and found a foot-shaped impression in some moss-covered ground that dwarfed my boot. That was enough. We decided not to do any fishing. On the way home, we stopped at the ranger station and asked if they had heard any reports of Bigfoot and learned real quickly why most people don't report their sightings. I was 17 and laying in my driveway smoking a cigarette. I was mad about something and I said to myself, I'm so pissed off right now if an alien ship flew above me I would tell them to F off. Typical teenager shit. At the exact moment I thought that I heard the sound of a foot scraping across the ground. I looked down since I was laying down and saw a man with white hair and a backpack walking down my street about 20 feet from me. I lived on a cul-de-sac and this man was not one of my neighbors. He was walking from the opening of my street toward the dead end. I watched him walk by and he got behind my car and I watched his feet go past my tire. I kept watching to see him walk out the other side, and I waited, and I waited. I never saw his feet walk past my tire, so at that moment I thought he was standing at the back of my car, so I get up to confront him, except he's gone, poof, no man on the road. No doors opened or closed on my street, and my neighborhood was cut out of a large hill, so there was no outlet except for the end of the road. But that's where he was walking from. It scared the ever-living shit out of me. I put my cigarette out and went back inside and locked the door. I have only told a few people about this. Edit. This was at about 11 p.m. Very quiet on my block and no one outside. Though I was in a neighborhood, it felt secluded and alone. Four and a half to five years ago, I found myself in the depths of Black Bear Swamp, a remote and secluded area known for its dense vegetation and elusive wildlife. It was a place where nature reigned supreme, and the boundaries between reality and the extraordinary often blurred. That day, I was accompanied by my girlfriend Sarah as we embarked on a leisurely hike through the swamp. The air was thick with humidity, 
and the sounds of chirping birds and rustling leaves filled the atmosphere. We reveled in the tranquility of the untouched wilderness, blissfully unaware of the astonishing events that were about to unfold. As we made our way through the thick undergrowth, a sudden thud resonated through the air, followed by a loud crack against the trunk of a towering pine tree. Startled, Sarah turned towards me, her eyes wide with alarm. Did you throw that rock at me? She accused, her voice trembling with a mix of confusion and anger. Taken aback by her accusation, I quickly denied any involvement. My mind raced, trying to comprehend what had just happened. It was impossible for me to have thrown a rock with such force and accuracy. Something else was at play. Our attention was abruptly diverted as movement caught our peripheral vision. Peering through the dense brush, we glimpsed a figure, large and hulking, swiftly making its way through the undergrowth. At first, we mistook it for a deer, but as it emerged into a clearing, the truth became undeniable. Before us stood a creature that defied explanation of Bigfoot. Its massive frame towered over the surrounding foliage, and its dark, shaggy fur blended seamlessly with the shadows. The creature moved with a grace and agility that belied its immense size. It cast a glance in our direction, its piercing eyes seeming to hold a hint of intelligence and curiosity. He just stared at us for a minute, and the disappeared into wilderness. True story. My fiancé has a really good one from when he was at West Point, the military academy. So there's a lot of haunted parts of West Point since it's so old, and tons of legends or ghost stories told by the cadets from over the years. It was during the summer, and the place was basically empty. He was on night duty for one of the oldest barracks on the campus. All night long, he kept hearing someone walking around on one of the floors above him, and when he would go up and check it out, this one room would have a light turned on. He kept turning off the light, locking the door, and then would go back down to his desk on the main floor. He said at first he thought someone was just messing with him, but then it started getting really annoying. So around 2 a.m., he gets a phone call from someone, a brigade commander or something. This guy starts screaming at him on the phone, Cadet, I'm looking at Scott Barracks, not sure if it was actually Scott, but for the story's sake, it's Scott Barracks right now and I see a light on the third floor. Go take care of that light. So my fiancé, fed up at this point, goes upstairs again, unlocks the room door, and turns off the light again. An hour later, he gets another call. Cadet, this is Lieutenant Colonel Mayer, and I'm looking at Scott Barracks, and that light on the third floor is still on. I want you to go turn it off, and then meet me at Thayer Statue to explain why you can't follow basic orders. Thayer Statue was a common meeting point for cadets, so after going up to the third floor one again, my fiancé makes his way to the statue to get chewed out by this lieutenant colonel and explain that the light kept going on even after he turned it off. At this point he was super creeped out, and it was really late, like 3 a.m., so he made one of his friends come with him, so they that they could both explain to this brigade commander what was going on. They get to the statue and wait. No one comes. They keep waiting because the last thing they want is to get in trouble for not waiting for a lieutenant colonel on top of the light. After an hour, no one came. They decide to leave. The next morning, he decided to tell his company commander what happened with the light and mentioned that lieutenant colonel Mayer had called them and then never showed up to Thayer statue to talk. The company commander turned pale, looked at my fiancé, and asked him if he was sure it was Lieutenant Colonel Mayer who had called. My fiancé was like, yeah, I'm sure he yelled at me twice and made me walk to meet him at 3 a.m. about it. Apparently, a decade earlier, a Lieutenant Colonel Mayer had committed us in those barracks in that room on the third floor. So my fiancé swears up and down that his ghost had called him that night and had kept turning on the lights in that room. I grew up in Alaska, just on the bubble of civilization, sort of. Up there, even in the big cities, you'll get bears and moose and such. I was walking home from the bus stop. Our driveway was about a half mile long through woods. I heard noise to my right and stopped, 
hoping it was anything other than the one animal that scares me. And then it stepped out of the trees. I froze. My blood felt cold and stopped in my veins. A moose, full-grown female, was standing maybe 20 feet from me in the middle of the road. It stopped and turned to look at me. I was scared with no backup plan. What can a 12 or so year old do against a full-grown moose? Then, it happened. I heard another noise. Behind me. I truly thought I was dead. I thought my life is now over. I'm about to be between a mama and a baby moose, and I'm going to die. I remember feeling frozen, and not at all tranquil and at peace. I couldn't even scream. From the edge of my eyesight, I saw the second moose emerge from the thick stand of alder trees and disappear behind me. I could hear the steps on the soft dirt. My eyes locked onto the moose in front of me, trying to will it to stay calm. I stopped breathing and then felt it. A gentle whoosh of warm air down the back of my neck, followed by the unmistakable sound of a forced inhale. The moose behind me was sniffing my head. I could feel the breath, hear the nostrils flare. Some neighbor had dogs off through the woods a ways, and they must have gotten out of their yard. They started barking inside the trees and startled both moose that turned and ran back the way they came, crashing into the small trees and leaving. To this day, the only animal I'm afraid of is moose. I've been fishing with brown bears, had black bears say hi as they walked by my camp. Mountain lions stalk us and then leave. Doesn't rattle me until I see a cow moose alone and then I just hope to whatever is higher than me, that I'm not between her and her cub. Well, there was an incident which taught me to regularly make what is called a J-turn to watch Borchek by back trail. I was scouting a distant group of hills along an inaccessible river no docks for miles. There were past rumors of mountain lions being back in there, though all the eastern breeds are supposedly not existence anymore. There had been a light snow before dawn, but it didn't hinder me from walking way back and cresting the highest hilltop where I could see the big bend of the river. For whatever reason, I decided to circle the tippy top of this hill before going back down, where I could then pick up my old trail where I walked inwards. When I completed my circling, I came back down but immediately but stopped dead. There were a second set of prints right next to my steps. Big paw prints. As I sat watching that river, there was a F-King big cat sitting somewhere watching me. Now heading back down, I had lost the high ground, and the pursuit position was now in his favor. I made J-turns every 300 yards on the way back. I make J-turns on the way in and out of every area I hunt if it is in a remote location. And yes, I seen dogs, deer, and even men following my paths before. My father, when he was in his late teens, used to hunt deer in New Zealand. This would have been the late 60s, early 70s. He was out with some friends hunting in thick bush at night, using a spotlight connected to a battery that they would carry in a backpack. My father saw the shine of deer eyes in the dark, a very easy shot. A direct and clean shot. On approaching the kill, a few things stood out to him as slightly unusual. Firstly was the horse he had killed. Secondly were the two terrified Maori guys who leapt from their tent next to the dead horse, understandably scared for their lives. I think he had to pay them enough to buy a couple of horses to clear the matter up. Also, he only ever hunted during daylight after that. I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. Keep in mind the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amounts of time being spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town, shut it down, and just lay down on the snow looking up at the majesty of it all, the only thing disturbing the silence being the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. Doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. 
On one particular night, without asking my parents it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be introspective. It wasn't all that interesting a scene. A few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring activity affecting the magnetic field, etc. And then I started noticing a clicking noise. At first I thought it was the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was there must be an animal nearby in which case I need to get out of there fast, you don't really want to mess with a wild animal. But the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was fairly mechanical sounding. And again, the source of the sound isn't coming from anywhere around me laterally. It was coming from up. So naturally I look up determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see. Stars, northern lights, a lazy satellite crossing the sky. All normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I notice something strange in the aurora borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first thinking they were oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring in morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger, yet still only remaining single points in the sky. All the while the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, almost like someone started with tapping a pen on a desk to clacking billard balls together inside my head. Then it stops. The lights are gone, the clicking is not heard, and aside from being a little stiff, cold, and rather petrified, I'm fine. So I jump back on the snowmobile thinking maybe I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer than usual to start up, and I'm beginning to worry, but soon it's running and I'm heading back to town. As I'm driving back several plausible scenarios as to what occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking it could have been a helicopter from the mine or some strange northern lights behavior, etc. Probably not that big a deal. I pull up to my house. Lights are all dark. Strange. It wasn't that late when I left. Open outer door as quietly as possible. Remove winter gear. Enter inner door. House is quiet. Really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anyone noticing proves to be easy as I'm soon under my covers. I go to set my alarm for the next day. All of the sudden everything makes sense. Engine hard to start, stiff, rather chilly. Nobody up when I was gone what felt like relatively short period of time. It was almost 11 p.m. when I left, and now it was creeping up on 6 a.m. I stood, staring at clicking lights for almost seven hours. I never ended up sleeping that night, and I don't go on late night snow machine rides anymore. Our team of Navy SEALs was on a covert operation near Japan, searching for vital intelligence concerning China's possible invasion of Taiwan. I led the team with Joe as my second in command, a seasoned warrior with a wealth of experience. Little did we know that this seemingly routine operation would lead us to the edge of our sanity. Joe, ever curious and adventurous, discovered a hidden underwater cave system during one of our reconnaissance missions. Intrigued by the mystery that lay within, he decided to gather a small group of five men, including myself, to investigate further. We donned our diving gear and descended into the depths, unaware of the horrors that awaited us. As we explored the labyrinthine cave system, our excitement turned to unease. The oppressive silence weighed heavily upon us, and an inexplicable sense of foreboding crept into our hearts. It was then that we unknowingly disturbed a nest of aquatic cryptids that had been lurking in the shadows, their existence unknown to the world above. The first sign of danger came with a sudden surge of movement in the water accompanied by an eerie silence that seemed to suffocate the very air we breathed. Our senses heightened, we realized we were being hunted. Vicious creatures, born of nightmares and hidden from human eyes, closed in on us with savage intent. 
A battle for survival ensued as we fought tooth and nail against the relentless onslaught of these aquatic horrors. Our training and instincts kicked in, but the cryptids were unlike anything we had ever encountered. Their strength, speed, and ferocity were otherworldly, pushing us to the brink of our physical and mental limits. One by one, my comrades fell to the cryptids' relentless assault, leaving only Joe and me to face the horrors that dwelled within the abyss. We fought with everything we had, employing every ounce of skill and determination to escape their clutches. But it was Joe, with his unwavering resolve and indomitable spirit, who found a way to lead us out of the abyss and back to the surface. After barely surviving the ordeal, Joe made a fateful decision. He chose to keep the existence of the cryptids a secret forever buried within the depths of the Pacific. He understood the consequences of revealing such a horrifying truth to the world, knowing that panic and chaos would ensue. And so, we returned to our lives, carrying the weight of the horrors we had witnessed deep within our souls. We never spoke of the cryptids again, silently accepting the burden of our experiences and the sacrifices made by our fallen comrades. It was a testament to our unwavering loyalty and dedication to protecting our nation, even when the threats we faced lurked in the shadows, forever hidden from the world's gaze. Story from my dad. Back in 1989, my dad was hunting out in New Kent County, Virginia. He feels uneasy throughout the morning, and then he gets really spooked to the point where he decides to leave. Nothing weird is happening, and he's a lifelong hunter who wouldn't normally leave the woods for a bad feeling. Can vouch, he's very practical. As he's driving home, he sees a bunch of cop cars at the rest stop near his hunt club. Later that evening, he finds out that the cops had found the bodies of victims of the Colonial Parkway killer near the rest stop in a spot fairly close to his tree stand. Anna Maria Phelps and Daniel Lauer as a true crime buff, when my dad told me this story last year, I lost my dang mind. In late fall of 2018, I was driving back home from work on a Saturday afternoon on I-271 South near Mayfield, Ohio. The weather was overcast and light rain was coming down and slowed down traffic due to rain. It wasn't very windy but the wind blew the rain to the southeast. Out of my periphery, I noticed to my right what resembled a large grouping of dark gray balloons floating silently from one side of the freeway to the other, above the tops of the cars on the same freeway. Upon closer inspection, I noticed these orbs hanging or grouping together in what resembled a D and a strand model. Some were attached to others, while the remainder were free-floating clinging together as they floated silently across and into obscurity. This was my third experience witnessing something anomalous, and I reported it months ago to author Preston Dennett. I've included the artistic recreation of my sighting. Coconino National Forest in Arizona stretches across a vast expanse its beauty mingling with the whispers of ancient legends. Deep within the woods, where the light battles to penetrate the thick foliage, stories of peculiar cryptids have been whispered for generations, stories of dogmen, elusive Bigfoot, and eerie crawlers lurking in the shadows. It is in this mysterious realm that our story unfolds. Meet Hillary, a young park ranger whose name was given to her by a father who harbored an irrational disdain for Hillary Clinton. Abandoned by her father, she forged her own path and found solace in the wild. Assigned to a remote watchtower nestled deep in the heart of the Coconino Forest, Hillary spends her nights scanning the wilderness, alert for any signs of danger. One fateful night, as the moon bathes the forest in its pale glow, a distress call crackles through the radio. A lost hiker pleads for assistance, disoriented in the labyrinthine trails. Hillary, ever dutiful, guides him back to safety, her heart pounding with a mix of relief and concern. But their journey takes an unexpected turn when they stumble upon an abandoned cabin, hidden amongst the towering trees. Curiosity tinged with unease, they cautiously step inside, their flashlights cutting through the gloom. 
Their breath catches in their throats as they discover the lifeless form of a police officer clutching a journal in his hand. The pages, filled with trembling handwriting, reveal a harrowing tale the officer's account of the gruesome discovery of ten bodies near the cabin. The corpses, stripped of flesh, bear the marks of a predator that devoured them to the core. Fear creeps into their hearts, tendrils of unease coiling around their minds. They step outside, drawn by morbid curiosity, to where the first body was found. Illuminated by the moon's ethereal light, they inspect the bones, haunted by the macabre scene. Suddenly, a branch snaps, the sound echoing through the silence of the forest. They turn in unison, eyes wide with trepidation. Above them looms a creature, towering and monstrous, a figure reminiscent of the Bigfoot, but far angrier and stronger. Without warning, it pounces upon the hapless hiker, his screams piercing the night. Hillary, her instincts kicking in, throws herself to the side, narrowly evading the creature's wrath. Desperation floods her senses as she fumbles for her firearm. The first shot reverberates through the air, followed by five more, each one hitting its mark. But the beast seems impervious to the bullets, its hide impenetrable. With each failed attempt to halt the creature's rampage, Hillary watches in horror as it ends the hiker's life, leaving only the hollow shell of what once was. Suddenly, the creature turns its attention towards the park ranger, its primal growls echoing with a bone-chilling ferocity. A shiver of terror courses through Hillary's veins, but she stands her ground, the gun trembling in her hands. With an enigmatic growl, the creature retreats, vanishing into the depths of the forest, leaving behind a trail of blood and dread. Scared and shaken, Hillary hastily reaches for her radio, her voice quivering as she calls for backup. At dawn, a team arrives a mixture of police and search and rescue personnel. Together, they comb the area, only to discover the grisly truth ten lifeless bodies, exactly as Hillary had described. But their response is met with skepticism, their belief in the fantastical tale waning. Haunted by the night's harrowing events, Hillary finds herself alone in her conviction, left to grapple with the horrors she witnessed. The truth, like the enigmatic creatures that haunt the Coconino National Forest, remains obscured, buried beneath layers of disbelief and fear. But within her, the echoes of that dreadful night continue to resonate, forever shaping her perception of the wilderness she once loved. Hi everyone. My partner and I just got back from a long camping trip in northern Arizona. Marble Canyon, Vermilion Cliffs, and finally in the Kaibab National Forest, where this encounter took place. We were driving off-roading all day on the forest roads deep in the forest, near the north rim of the Grand Canyon. We were hunting hard for the perfect camping spot, and it was starting to get dark and my partner was getting frustrated. So we told ourselves, we'll go to the end of the next trail and camp there. Unfortunately, where that trail ended was at an expansive burn scar forest that was completely wiped out by fire last summer. Very few living trees remained standing. It was spooky, but we decided to make the best of the situation. After getting camp set up and eating dinner, we were just hanging out by the fire. We started hearing some snapping branches in the woods and light up our flashlights. We see nothing. I grab my shotgun just in case. At this point, we're trying to be as quiet as possible, listening very intently to the woods. It was a clear night, but no moon. It was very dark beyond the reaches of the firelight. Then we hear what sounds like a whisper of a woman. We try so hard to make out the words, but it sounded foreign, like another language. It shortly thereafter grows to a crying sound, then turns to wailing, like someone in incredible pain. We were absolutely terrified at this point. The sound eventually stops, and we started to feel very unwelcome and very cold. We knew immediately this was a very strange paranormal experience, but not sure if this like a skinwalker or maybe just a ghost. What do you think? I travel often for work, and I was driving through New Mexico on I-40. I drive about 40-50 thousand miles a year, 
and I have never seen anything paranormal. I have driven this route, but not for about four years. I'm driving west on I-40 and out of the blue, I spotted a blur moving down the hill mountain at a ridiculously fast speed. In a span of about five seconds, my brain did its best to make sense of what I was seeing. Coyote was the first thing that came to mind the way it was moving looked like a canine. The next thing I realized was that this thing was huge, maybe the size of a horse. I've often seen horses run down the fence lines on hills, and that was my next thought. But the shape was wrong. The speed was also way off. This creature was flying down the side of this mountain. The whole time I'm really not feeling anything but confusion and nothing is really registering as off just because it's happening so fast. I have a thought that we are going to meet at a point about two to three hundred yards down the road. So I think to myself when I drive by I'll get a closer look. When I passed where we should have met, there was nothing. No fence, no houses, nothing to explain a horse. There was no sign of the animal, like it just ran through a portal or something. There were no shrubs, trees, or anything that could have hidden the animal. At this point, I got a very eerie sense of dread like I had to get away. I pulled into a gas station about 30 men down the road. This is what really creeped me out. I felt like I couldn't trust anyone. I had this uncomfortable feeling of mistrust and suspicion. I felt like everyone I came across knew what I saw. Normal everyday people, it's like I felt I was going to run into someone or something dangerous. I drove on through Gallup and up to Shiprock and into Cortez. I can't shake the feeling of fear and couldn't bring myself to shower late at night in a strange hotel. I've never been one to believe in paranormal stories, but I just can't explain to myself what this was. I keep thinking about it and I just can't logically explain it. Horse-sized wolf canine dari gray hair with white belly. Fast, extremely fast. Has anyone ever seen anything similar in the area? I'm from Texas, never been around reservations or Native America much. I'm just very confused and would like to hear about anything similar. I had always been drawn to the wilderness, the quiet solitude of the forest, the thrill of the hunt. It was a primal calling that had been ingrained in me since childhood, and no matter how much the world around me changed, the wilderness remained my sanctuary. So when the opportunity arose for a weekend hunting trip deep into the heart of a supposedly haunted forest in New Mexico, I couldn't resist the challenge. The forest was known by locals as El Bosque Encantado, the Enchanted Forest, and tales of strange happenings had swirled around it for generations. Disappearances, eerie lights, and unsettling whispers were just some of the stories that made brave hunters and curious adventurers approach it with caution. But I, Larry, was never one to back down from a challenge. Armed with my trusty rifle and a backpack filled with supplies, I ventured into the heart of this enigmatic woodland. The forest swallowed me whole as I ventured deeper into its depths, the trees towering above me like ancient sentinels. It was a dense, dark labyrinth that seemed to absorb sound and light, casting an eerie gloom over everything. The air was thick with tension, and even the soft rustling of leaves sent shivers down my spine. As I stalked my prey a majestic buck that would be the envy of every hunter I began to notice strange occurrences. My compass spun wildly, refusing to point in any one direction, rendering it useless in this maze of trees. The wind seemed to whisper secrets in a language I couldn't understand, and shadows moved in the periphery of my vision, just beyond reach. I chalked it up to fatigue and the natural unease that often accompanies solitary hunting trips. But as the hours passed, the phenomena escalated. Strange symbols etched into the bark of trees, glowing with an otherworldly light, appeared before me, guiding me deeper into the heart of the forest. It was as if some invisible force was luring me further into its clutches. Night descended upon the forest, and the darkness was absolute. The usual sounds of nocturnal creatures were absent, replaced by a profound stillness that sent a shiver down my spine. My campfire provided little comfort as I sat with my back to a massive tree, my rifle clutched tightly in my trembling hands. That's when I saw it a figure, or perhaps a shadow, moving among the trees. 
It was neither human nor animal, its shape shifting and ethereal. I felt a cold sweat break out on my brow as a deep sense of dread washed over me. It was as if the very forest itself had taken form to challenge my presence. I raised my rifle, aiming at the elusive figure, but it seemed to dissipate like smoke, reappearing at will. Panic seized me, and I fired wildly into the night. The forest answered with eerie laughter, echoing through the trees like a mocking chorus. Terrified and disoriented, I fled through the dark woods, guided only by instinct. The forest seemed to shift and change around me, as if the very earth beneath my feet was a living, malevolent force. I stumbled upon a clearing, bathed in the pale light of the moon, and collapsed onto the ground, gasping for breath. As dawn broke, I emerged from the enchanted forest, battered and shaken, my mind filled with the haunting memories of that dreadful night. I had survived, but I had witnessed things that defied all logic and reason. The haunted forest had tested my beliefs, my courage, and my very understanding of the natural world. I returned home, haunted by the supernatural experiences I had endured, and struggled to find the words to share my ordeal with others. They would never understand the terror I had faced in that dense, haunted wilderness, where the line between reality and the supernatural had blurred, and where the forest itself seemed to come alive to challenge the souls brave enough to enter its depths. My first time hunting in a deer stand by myself as opposed to hunting with my father. I was 14 at the time and very excited to be trusted to hunt alone. Well being the stupid 14 year old I was, I forgot to bring a flashlight and had to walk about one quarter mile down a trail to the main trail where I would get picked up. So there I am walking down this dark trail in the middle of the woods alone. I am not scared of the dark, but naturally it is very quiet and any normal human would be a touch jumpy. Well what I didn't know at the time was that turkeys sleep in the top of trees. I just assumed they spent their whole life on the ground and only flew when absolutely necessary. So imagine my surprise when I walk directly underneath one and feet over my head, a full-grown turkey takes off full speed through the top of the tree yelping. I physically jumped in the air and absolutely froze with fear. My 14-year-old brain could not find the directory with turkey listed as a possible outcome so for 10 seconds, I was completely frozen in fear trying to figure out what I just heard. Needless to say, when I told the story to my dad later, he got the biggest laugh out of it and explained to my city boy self that turkeys sleep in treetops. Texas Hunter here. I've been hunting for a few years so I've seen my fair share of weird shit. Rabbits killed by coyotes among other things. Bobcat screams are also pretty freaky. But one day while walking on my property through the woods I heard some branches quietly break about 30 yards ahead. Nothing too weird about that as rabbits and coyotes bump into them all the time. It happened again but this time a little closed and to my right side. I unholstered my .45 XDS. I like the compact version because it feels better. Ready to shoot a hungry coyote. The day before my neighbor told me how a few women in Little Elm got mauled by some pissed off coyotes a few days earlier. So I was ready to shoot. Anyways, I shined my flashlight through the trees and didn't see anything. Kept walking but a little faster and I heard a high scream with low undertones. Didn't sound like nothing I've ever heard before. I swear it sounded like a Bobcat F. Ed Batman. Took off sprinting back to my house a mile or so away. I'm near the woods tree line and look back to see a hunched shadow 40 yards behind staring at me. Like a person trying to walk on all for us. It was dark so it might have been my imagination. Noped the F out and got to my house. Never seen it since and didn't sleep for a few nights. At the time I wasn't hunting, I liked to go for nighttime walks to clear my head. But I never go without my gun. Stay safe and be careful because I don't know what it was. Hello. Have you ever heard about the real stories of Okinawa ghosts? Having personally experienced numerous eerie moments while working in the now abandoned Naval Hospital Okinawa, 
I can attest to the lingering presence of the supernatural. The hospital, now a mere empty shell, stands on Camp Lester, but its basement harbors a haunting secret, an enduring reminder of its gruesome past. Blood stains still mar the walls, bearing witness to the horrors that once unfolded within. During my fourth year, just before my permanent change of station PCS, I had a spine-chilling encounter. One of the janitors, a sweet elderly Japanese man who had been a part of the hospital for decades, took me down to the basement. He revealed to me that it had been the morgue, a place where he had witnessed unspeakable sights. He recounted how he had painstakingly collected body parts that had fallen out of the body bags. The gruesome memories of the hospital's early days had left an indelible mark on his soul. However, it was my own personal experience on the fifth deck ramp that truly sent shivers down my spine. I often ascended the stairs to assist with labor and delivery, and the hospital had ramps in place to facilitate movement during typhoons or elevator malfunctions. It was on one such occasion that I found myself transporting a peacefully sleeping mother to the postpartum ward. As I glanced out of the window, an image froze me in my tracks ahead, a floating head right outside the window. The sight was undeniably terrifying. Others had witnessed it too, confirming my belief that I was not alone in this eerie encounter. Yet, despite the corroboration of others, I could not shake off the feeling of unease that gripped me whenever the memory resurfaced. In my mind, I attributed it to the exhaustion and sleep deprivation that often plagued those who worked within the hospital's haunted halls. About ten years ago, I was home alone, sitting in the den watching TV. The doorway to the den opened up into a hallway, and just across the hallway and offset a little ways was the doorway that went into the kitchen. Setting in my recliner, I could see into the hallway, and if I leaned back enough, I could see partway into the kitchen. So anyway, I'm sitting there watching TV and I hear something. I look into the hallway and don't laugh, there's a pecan rolling down the hallway. My first reaction is, there's someone in the kitchen messing with me. I lean back and look into the kitchen, there's no one there. On the far side of the kitchen is another door that goes into another hallway that if you take a right it goes out back. A left will take you out front into the carport. I get up and go look. Both doors are shut and locked and no one around. I picked up the pecan, put it back in the bucket which was setting in the hallway by the back door, and go back to my recliner. A few minutes later another pecan goes rolling down the hallway. I bolted out of my chair like my butt was on fire trying to catch whoever was doing it. Same story, no one around but me, and both doors were still shut and locked. Now I guess is the time to say, I'm not a believer in ghosts, but I'm having second thoughts. I put the pecan back in the bucket, check the doors one more time and go back to my chair. Just a few more minutes in my chair and another pecan goes rolling down the hallway. I get up. Go pick up the pecan and outload, I said. Okay, I'm tired of picking up your shit, stop it now. I put the pecan back in the bucket, went back to my chair and nothing ever happened again. To this day, I still don't know what was doing it. My youngest daughter swears the house was haunted. She claims to have woken up in the middle of the night with someone, a man, standing at the foot of her bed watching her. He was dressed in a Civil War uniform. I never asked her if he was from the north or south. She said he never made any attempt to harm her. She just put her head under the covers, and after a few minutes he'd be gone. But it happened enough that it spooked her pretty good. Her bedroom was upstairs. She wouldn't go to her bedroom at night if she was the only one at home. Instead, she'd stay in the living room with every light in the house on, and the front door open for a fast getaway. A few days ago, I met with one of my friends from school at a local cafe, and this is when I was doing my shift. He had ordered a latte when I had recognized him. He had also recognized me when he looked right at me. We chatted pleasantries while I made coffee to know that he was now a park ranger. I was interested and asked him to tell me more about his job after my shift. After my shift had ended, I walked over to his table while he was reading a book. He began telling me about how he first loved his job, 
but recently had been having some strange supernatural occurrences that creeped him out. He was even considering resigning. I asked him what he saw, and he told me about some things that he had seen that were very concerning. One day near dusk, he was patrolling the park along with three of the rangers. They walked and patrolled the stream that flows in the park so they don't get lost. When it was completely dark, they turned back towards the cabins of the park rangers. As they were walking, they saw a big creature just a few feet away from them. It was almost eight feet tall with thick hands and feet. It nearly matched the description of a Bigfoot, except it had the head of a lion. My friend and his co-workers got so scared they began running towards the cabin, blindly shooting behind them. The creature was so thick and heavy that it could not run as fast as them, struggling to keep up. Soon, they started to see bright lights shining outside the cabin every night as it came closer. When they reached the cabin door and looked back, there was no creature in sight, especially not the Bigfoot-looking lion. They told the whole occurrence to the rest of the rangers. They did not believe them at first, but one of the rangers said he believed them since he also saw something unnatural a few days back. Only he didn't dare to share. He thought it was just his imagination. On asking him what he saw, he told them he saw a small creature almost one foot tall with thin stick-like arms and legs, totally opposite to what my friend and the other rangers had seen that patrolled around with him. I was shocked to hear these types of creatures existed and advised him to resign and get a job that's away from the supernatural. He said that no job is away from the supernatural as they could always shape shift or choose to be invisible if they wish. So even my job of serving coffee, I could have an encounter with anything unnatural. In 2013, I, Officer Torg, managed to secure an actual live DNA sample from a livestock kill while investigating the supposed Lizardman case out in Bishopville, South Carolina. It was 8.1 a.m. when I responded to several calls reporting a large unknown predator supposedly killing livestock. Upon arriving and following standard protocol for such a call, I quickly realized the severity of the situation. I established a perimeter around the kill site to keep onlookers away. At 8.20 a.m., I obtained saliva from an unknown source on one of the cattle. I reported that it was not possible to tell if it was human or animal. By 9.30 a.m., all the evidence had been gathered and moved to the evidence room, awaiting analysis. I was told that I would have the DNA results in approximately three weeks. As always, I strongly urged anybody with information regarding this incident to please report to their local authorities immediately, so these investigations could be taken care of under proper jurisdiction. Additionally, two young men reportedly saw what they described as a lizardman along a very rural road in eastern South Carolina on Sunday night. According to reports, these two 19-year-old men were driving along a stretch of highway near Bishopville when they came across something in the road. They turned around and saw what they described as a seven-foot-tall lizardman and quickly drove off. When asked for further comment, they both insisted that this was no man in a costume but a real-life lizardman. They believed it must have been the same one seen back in the 80s by the young man who had his own sighting in Skateboard Swamp in 1984. We were out in a state park tent camping, not far from civilization at all. Three of us. After drinking a bit too much and some other partying, we hiked a bit up the mountain behind our camp. Stupid. It was pitch black with a very steep incline. About 30 minutes into the hike, in the middle of nowhere, we see a structure. It's a door and not much else. The door is built into a brick building. It had four walls, but the structure was so small and built just for the door. The front was about six feet wide, and then from front to back it was probably two feet. I know it doesn't sound that creepy, but when you find a closed door on a tiny brick building, throw in the partying, and it becomes really, really creepy. Turns out the door was unlocked. So we open it, and there's no floor inside, but a ladder going down. You bet your ass none of us had the balls to go down. We dropped some rocks that took quite a while to hit the bottom. 
No splash, just a solid smack of rock against concrete. Sorry for the boring ending, but there wasn't much more to the story. Shit was real strange though. It was a long time ago, I have no recollection of where it was, so if I wanted to ever go back I'm Saul. I am Jay, a 28 year old warehouse worker, prefer to keep my last name anonymous. The event I'm about to share took place while I was hunting with my dog in a rural area I refer to as Black Bay, Florida. I've only recently felt confident enough to tell this story. I've kept it to myself and close family for a very long time. After several hours, I decided it was time to head back home before it became too dark to find my way. As we made our way through the fields, I hopped the last fence and waited for my large dog to squeeze through the gate. We were about 20 feet away from the start of the path when I heard a whoop on one side, followed by a sharp whistle on the adjacent side. Initially, I thought the sounds were birds, but as the unidentified sounds continued, I realized something else was going on. I took a few more steps, and suddenly, something let out a deep growl followed by a yell. It stunned me and confused me. I had never heard anything remotely close to that before. I managed to catch a glimpse of something reddish-brown crossing the path, although it wasn't much taller than me. As the noise subsided, I mustered the courage to make my way through the path and finally reach my residence. The only way home was through the path that this creature had just crossed. The sun was almost down, so it was a moment of flight or fight, and I chose flight. When I arrived home, my mother noticed that something was wrong. She was outside collecting clothes off the line and asked if I had heard a strange noise coming from that direction, but I couldn't reply. I was still in shock. At the time, I hadn't heard much about Bigfoot, but I knew that what I saw that day wasn't your average local wildlife. It was possibly a family of ape-like creatures crossing the path, and I have a theory. Now I understand that what I encountered was a family because I heard three vocalizations that evening. Back then, it was hard to understand what was happening, but now I believe I must have come between the juvenile and the adult. That's why they distracted me and ultimately scared the living crap out of me, to ensure I didn't hurt their young. Living my life in central West Virginia, I have spent a lot of time hunting in the Monongahela National Forest. While bow hunting in a stand of red spruce on October 31st, yes, Halloween, this happened to me. This takes place back when portable stands had a chain that wrapped around the tree and fall protection consisted of two pieces of seat belt material, one around the tree ran through the other wrapped around your waist. I was in the stand overlooking a small creek and had watched a couple of doe walk by and decided to stay until full darkness. The moon had risen early so there was some light and I had a flashlight in my pack. As I was getting ready to lower my bow, I heard loud winged beats heading towards me through the spruce trees, when all of a sudden, a very large owl landed on a branch about 10 yards from me. I sat motionless watching the owl as it sat there watching me. After several minutes, I slowly turned my head to look back to the creek to check for deer one more time before climbing down. All of a sudden, I heard wing beats again and the owl was flying straight towards me with talons extended. I threw my arms up, dropping my bow in the process and screamed at the demon owl who was trying to knock me to the ground. Fortunately, the owl veered away from me and I didn't fall out of the tree. After a few minutes, I regained my composure, packed up and walked out to my truck without any more harrowing experiences. Nearly a year ago, the people living along the riverfront near Preston were set agog by the appearance in the woods of a strange being in human form. When discovered by a party of hunters on his all fours pawing and neighing like a horse, their attention was first attracted by what they took to be the whining of a startled horse in the undergrowth. When advanced upon, the strange being ran off on his hands and feet but the pursuers gained upon him so rapidly he sprang to his feet and quickly covering the short distance to the river, plunged headlong from a rather high bank into the water and swam to the Indian side. When he reached that bank he stood up, shook himself like a horse just out of a bath, 
and with what might really be called a hoarse laugh ran off into the woods. Some months later he was seen under much the same conditions, but this time west of Woodville on the Indian side. Only a few weeks ago a man crawled across the road in plain view of several people, not far from where the horseman was first seen but disappeared, the pursuit being somewhat tardy. Since Sunday last the people living near Colbert, 10 miles east of Preston, Grayson County, Texas, have been hunting for a strangely acting man who crawled about like a snake until pursued, when he would jump to his feet and outrun the fastest horses ridden after him. Others who pursued him on foot say they shot at him at close range, but the bullets, if they struck their target, seemed to have no effect. As late as last evening, children claimed to have seen the crawling man again near the Varner Place, six miles from Colbert. A phone message from Colbert this afternoon confirms previous reports sent out from Durant about the state of excitement and the gathering of several parties for pursuit, but states that public interest has received something of a chill because some of the parties who were present when the close-range shots were tired say that although the peculiar being was in the open and very close, that he disappeared with the smoke of the powder. At the Varner place he crawled into the hen house. It is stated that out in the field a dead chicken, bitten in the neck, and from which there was the appearance of the blood having been drawn, was found. Though with somewhat reduced enthusiasm, the people of the Varner neighborhood are preparing for another big roundup this afternoon and tonight. It was the time leading up to Easter, and our family was residing on a sprawling ranch near Molala, Oregon. Life on the ranch revolved around tending to our cattle, chickens, turkeys, and pigs. One particular evening, as we made our way home, the headlights illuminated an astonishing sight. In the glow, we caught a glimpse of a rare albino Bigfoot, crouched behind some bushes, attempting to conceal itself. But it was too late. We had already laid eyes on the extraordinary creature. Standing at an impressive seven feet tall, it sported long, flowing hair that cascaded down its body, reaching an astonishing length of eight to nine inches. The hair, a light green color, was a striking contrast against the darkness of the night. In that moment, my mom jokingly remarked, looks like the Easter Bunny's back again. It seemed that this was becoming somewhat of an annual tradition, the third consecutive year that we had encountered the white Bigfoot, always around the Easter season. It would linger in the vicinity for several consecutive nights, evidenced by the howling of our dogs. Our ranch was located near the town of Colton, which had been mentioned earlier, making it a close neighbor to these mysterious encounters. Each sighting left us in awe and wonder, with the enigmatic presence of the white Bigfoot becoming a part of our Easter festivities, adding an element of excitement and intrigue to the season. When in the RAF I was based at Scampton, this was the base where the Dam Busters raid was launched from and a bomber command airfield during the war. I was on guard duty one night and had a phone call around 2 a.m. about noises coming from one of the hangars. Sent a guard to investigate, he radios back and says he can hear voices mumbling and what sounds like machinery operating and tools clanging, etc. I got out the keys to the hangar and on driving up sure enough, there were such noises going on and the occasional flickering light. We called in the RAF police dogs, but the land shark refused to go in. This highly trained attack dog lay down, whimpered and refused to listen to its handler. I went in with the guard and the RAF policeman and can only describe the feeling on entering the hangar floor as being surrounded in a cold fog that you couldn't see and a real feeling of dread. There was a real feeling of unhappiness in the place. I have never felt like that since, nor do I ever want to. We hightailed it out as it was secure, and there was clearly no one there. Found out about a year or so later, when speaking to some visiting Bomber Command veterans, that it was a hangar used in the war for battle repairs on the damaged aircraft. And sometimes were aircraft which had crew members killed in them, and sometimes it took some time to either extract their bodies or gather up the bits, would be taken to be cleaned. I have been back to Scampton since, but I give that hangar a very wide berth.
My father had always been drawn to the great outdoors. Growing up, he would often accompany my grandfather on their expeditions, exploring various places with a sense of curiosity that seemed to run in the family. It was no surprise that my father eventually became a park ranger, immersing himself in the beauty of nature and creating countless memories for our family. There was a particular holiday season when the National Park welcomed an influx of tourists seeking adventure. Some were simply looking for a fun experience, while others were engaged in field research. Among them was a team of five researchers, a group that stood out with their intelligence and sanity, surpassing even the most educated of visitors. Late one night, my father received a distress signal on his walkie-talkie from one of his fellow researchers. Equipped with his trusty rifle, he embarked on a mission to investigate. As the terrain became impassable for his jeep, They continued on foot, deciding to split up and search in two different directions to cover more ground. To ensure their safety and avoid getting lost, they tied ribbons along their respective paths yellow for my father and blue for one of his partners. As my father ventured deeper into the woods, he found no trace of the rest of the group. Attempting to contact his partner through the walkie-talkie proved futile. There was no response. Undeterred, he pressed on, tying ribbons along the way. However, he began to notice something peculiar. He kept encountering yellow ribbons tied to trees, suggesting that he might have taken a different route than he intended. After a brief rest under a tree, he examined one of the ribbons more closely and realized it wasn't the same ribbon he had tied earlier. These ribbons appeared weathered and worn, and unlike his single knot, these were double knotted. This raised a sense of unease within him. The area they were in was restricted, reserved for important personnel only. Who could have journeyed this far and tied these yellow ribbons? Determined to unravel the mystery, my father decided to follow these unfamiliar markers, hoping they would lead him to the correct ones. As he retraced his steps, he heard faint sounds and noticed flickering lights emanating from a certain direction. Curiosity got the better of him, and he cautiously approached the source of the commotion. To his horror, he stumbled upon a group of researchers wearing bizarre attire, engaged in a macabre dance around a central fire. Four individuals were present, but one was conspicuously missing. Hidden behind a tree, my father observed as two members of the group emerged from the woods, carrying a large wooden branch with a man bound to it. The man's hands and legs were tightly secured and it was evident that he had met a grim fate he had been prepared for some horrific ritual, cooked alive. Shaken by what he had witnessed, my father attempted to contact his partner for assistance, yet no response came. Realizing the danger he was in, he decided to make his escape. As he turned to flee, he sensed a lingering presence, something lurking in the shadows. These cannibalistic murderers were still pursuing him. In a desperate attempt to divert their attention, My father climbed up a tree, silently praying that they would leave. From his vantage point, he observed their ghastly appearance emaciated, white-skinned creatures resembling humans, but with grotesque features. Their hollowed-out eyes and elongated fangs sent chills down his spine. Finally, they dispersed, unaware of his hidden perch. Carefully descending the tree, my father cautiously scanned his surroundings, ensuring the creatures were gone. Exhausted and drained, he began to lose consciousness. It was then that he realized he had been poisoned, some unknown substance seeping into his skin. Collapsing onto the forest floor, his next recollection was waking up in a hospital bed. When my father recounted the harrowing incident to senior officials, they dismissed his claims and denied any clearance he had held. It wasn't long after that he was stripped of his position as a park ranger stripped of everything he had worked for in his career. Subsequently, he received multiple death threats, a grim reminder of the sensitive information he possessed, and the things he had seen that fateful day an ominous secret that could never be allowed to reach the public. I grew up on an Indian reservation here in Oklahoma. I am Cherokee Indian. Our home was by a massive cave system and in the middle of two hills. There is a cave on the property that everyone on the reservation knows Sasquatch exists. 
It is common knowledge where we come from. We would know their moods just by the sounds he made. When he was upset, you would know it because his anger would be heard throughout the whole reservation. People talked about it in casual conversation. For instance, did you hear Sasquatch upset last night, etc.? My grandparents told me not to fear him because they had a pact with him and he would not harm us. All was good until more Sasquatch came. These were evil ones, not the same as the Sasquatch that had always been there. He had been run off from the territory, we believe. I had to walk down a long dirt road to get to my school bus. They would chase me up in the woods, whooping and throwing rocks at me. I was terrified and I got a feeling they wanted to hurt me. It kept getting worse. I refused to even walk to school after that. At night when my cousins would come over, we would all play outside in the front yard. These new Sasquatch would gather around in the hills with their glowing red eyes and watch us. I know if our parents would have not been out there, they would have taken us and harmed us. I could feel it. I could sense their body and their bad intentions. I told my family that they were bad. My uncle did not listen. He went for a walk alone to the water, which was like a mile and a half from his house. He was drowned in knee-deep water and was an avid swimmer. No wounds, just a mysterious death. But I knew they killed him. He was the first of many unknown mysterious deaths that started to occur by the water. In that area, the person was always alone. It was always a mystery. I'm glad I stuck with my gut feelings because they were getting more aggressive every day that I walked to school. I believe my instincts saved my life. To this day, they are still killing people in the area. The person is always alone and the death is always a mystery. But I know and so do the other people on the reservation. Always follow your instincts. I'll send you more stories at a later date. Thank you for reading. Back to Creepy. This was out by a campground of several natural springs. A friend and I same buddy from before decided to strike out and go explore some very dilapidated and ancient looking farm structures we'd seen earlier in the day. We decided to go at night because F being sane, right? It was a small cluster of buildings far off next to some woods. We hiked through the brush to get there, but there was also a really torn up, weed choked dirt road that led to it. The buildings were completely decrepit and looked like they were going to collapse if we breathed too hard. We went to the biggest barn-like building and immediately began to smell death. As we got to the interior, we noticed some really unnerving things. First, despite the fact that these buildings no longer had any functional purpose, it was clear that people still went out there. There were fresh footprints that did not belong to us. Second, there seemed to be blood spattered all over the place. Third, there were pieces of wood that had been sharpened into crude, short stakes that were absolutely drenched in blood. Fourth, there were scattered clumps of what looked to me at least to be human hair. Lastly, it looked like someone had used the blood-stained stakes to try and scrawl something on a couple walls and on a load-bearing post in the center of the building. I couldn't make it out, probably better that way. So yeah, we decided to GTFO immediately. We decide to leave via a slightly different route because we were ultra paranoid that someone was watching and would follow us back to camp. As we made our way back, we hit a truly putrid wall of that death stench again. We found the source. It was the rear half of a calf. Just the rear half. The front half was absolutely nowhere in sight. The worst thing about it, though, is that this animal was cut clean in half. It did not look like an animal attack at all. No other wounds, just perfectly snipped in half. We made it back to camp and left the next morning. I was 16, 17, around 2009, with a group of friends, eight of us maybe walking down my block in Forest Park, Illinois, heading towards one of my friend's house. It was summer, around 9 p.m. The sun was already set. Once we made it to the end of my block at an intersection, perched atop of 20 feet street light was a figure. Humanoid, definitely, but with wings standing relatively still. I and all of my friends saw it. Started out it for maybe a few seconds. 
all muttering WTF. After those seconds of collective confusion, the thing spread its wings fully. I don't think either of us saw it fly off or anything because the moment it did that, we all took off running. Half of us one way and the other half another. Guessing neither of us has ever run that fast in our lives. I eventually made it to the friend's house we were originally intending to get to. Obviously, we were freaked out, asking each other WTF did we just see. Honestly, really not talking about it too much after the situation. I'm 29 now. None of those friends that I still keep in contact with remember seeing red eyes. But everything else was the same as how the Mothman is described. At this time, neither of us had even heard of the Mothman, or even that there has been a sighting in the Chicago area. But I, without a doubt, know what I saw was real, because the group saw the exact same thing at the exact same moment. If I was by myself, I don't know if I would have believed it. Honestly, we were out of there so fast that I couldn't pick up much of the vibes that it gave off. All I know is that wasn't an owl, a crane, or a drone. It kind of reminded me of the creature from the Jeepers Creepers film, if you know of that movie. Not a scary one, but it was definitely pretty awesome to me. I saw fresh deer signs going into this meadow through some aspen when I was out for an early morning hike. I approached the clearing from downwind and made my way toward it almost imperceptibly slow. The grass in the clearing was ridiculously tall and lush and covered in cool dew, and I could see why the deer would have found this so attractive on a summer morning. I made my way into the grass and got near into the middle when I saw a six-point buck come out from behind some trees on the other side. He looked at me for a minute and knocked his antlers a little bit against a tree. I didn't want to get him riled so I lowered myself into the grass. When I did that the whole herd of does quietly stood up all around me. They were bedded in the grass and I couldn't see them. They didn't seem spooked at all and just lazily started to make their way out of the clearing. A small doe strolled by so close in fact that I almost wanted to touch her. Just a really serene and beautiful sight. I'm a ranger in Yosemite National Park, and I believe I've witnessed something that people refer to as a real-life alien spaceship. I even had the audacity to touch it with my bare hands. It was a few years back when I was still quite new to the job, on May 7, 2003 to be exact. I was assigned to patrol an area due to reports of strange sounds being heard every night past midnight. There were also rumors of dazzling light shows resembling full laser displays. Some speculated that teenagers were having parties in the woods as the reason behind these noises, but deep down, I knew that explanation didn't make any sense. A couple of rangers had already been investigating the case, but with little progress. That's when I was added to the team. At 23 years old, full of enthusiasm to solve the mystery, I delved into every aspect of the investigation. I meticulously gathered testimonies from witnesses, surveyed the entire area, and tracked possible suspects. I even started camping in the suspected sites. Night after night, I immersed myself in the darkness of the woods, becoming intimately familiar with the creatures that emerged when the sun set. I witnessed unexplainable phenomena and unexplained disappearance of a human right before my eyes, insects glowing with a mesmerizing flicker of light. I documented everything, but unfortunately, in 2003, phone cameras were not as accessible as they are now. So I had no clear evidence of these extraordinary occurrences. It was during the last night at the final location on the list when everything changed. As the clock neared five, I was setting up camp when suddenly, all my gadgets emitted strange static noises. Initially, I considered the possibility of equipment failure and thought about heading back but something felt off. The day before, everything was functioning perfectly fine. Nonetheless, after a few minutes, the strange static ceased and everything returned to normal. With little hope of finding answers, I shared my discoveries with my fellow rangers. Some believed me, while others laughed it off. To those who believed, they mentioned having witnessed similar phenomena, 
but failing to find any trace of it upon returning to investigate. It seemed to appear and vanish in the right place at the right time, defying rational explanation. With a glimmer of hope, I returned to the exact spot where the specter had presented itself. I moved around the area, searching every nook and cranny, but to no avail. It was truly gone. As I sat down to have my dinner, the full moon cast its radiant glow, illuminating the surroundings. Lost in my thoughts, I caught a sudden flash of light in my peripheral vision. It was momentary, but it showed me the way. Intrigued, I followed the direction of the light, and soon enough, my walkie-talkie began emitting an intense, unsettling static noise. Fearing it might alert whatever entity was responsible, I swiftly turned it off. With a mix of excitement and trepidation, I scoured the area until, finally, at around 10 p.m., I stumbled upon an awe-inspiring sight. Before me floated a colossal structure resembling an egg with rings like Saturn, slowly ascending into the night sky. Its metallic surface emitted an otherworldly glow, reflecting the moon's light. I hid behind a nearby tree, my heart pounding in my chest. This was it. This was the revelation of an unseen side of our world, and I was an astonished witness to it. Crouching down, I observed the object with bated breath. It hovered, surrounded by its rotating rings, an enigmatic spectacle. It was pitch black, and its presence emanated a deep engine-like rumble. I marveled at its presence, captivated by the sheer magnitude of the moment. Suddenly, the stillness shattered as the outer shell of the object began to crack. The rings on its surface emitted a neon blue light, reminiscent of an ethereal glow. It was a sight beyond comprehension, defying any earthly explanation. My eyes remained fixated on the spectacle as four metallic pipes extended from the craft, acting as sturdy supports. It stood there, frozen in place, and I dared not make a sound. Time seemed to blur as I crouched there, overwhelmed by a mixture of awe and fear. Hours passed, but nothing else transpired. The cracks on the surface of the object closed, returning it to its original form. An eerie stillness settled over the surroundings as the craft slowly began to rise, its presence dominating the night sky. Driven by curiosity and a thirst for answers, I mustered the courage to approach the vessel cautiously. Every movement was deliberate as I crawled on all fours, avoiding any unnecessary noise. With each painstaking inch, I drew closer to the enigmatic craft, anticipation surging through my veins. Finally, I reached out, extending my hand to touch the metallic surface. The sensation was surreal, a smooth, cool texture beneath my fingertips. It was a moment of connection, a tangible encounter with the unknown. However, as I prepared to caress the craft, a high-pitched noise pierced the air, reverberating through my eardrums. The intensity was overwhelming, causing me to clutch my ears in agony. The next thing I knew, I awakened in a hospital bed, disoriented and bewildered. I had been found unconscious by a fellow ranger and rushed to the hospital when I failed to regain consciousness. The details surrounding my sudden collapse remained a mystery, but I knew deep down that my encounter with the otherworldly craft had played a part. Since that fateful day, I've become even more determined to uncover concrete evidence of their existence. The encounter, the warning signal of the high-pitched noise, and the subsequent disappearance of the craft all reinforced my belief that these beings walked among us, observing from the shadows. They were aware of our presence, and perhaps they had become more cautious, making their activities less frequent and conspicuous. Armed with my conviction, I continue my search for proof hoping to share my extraordinary experiences with those willing to listen. The encounter with the alien ship had forever altered my perception of the world, reminding me that there is still so much left to uncover. As a ranger in Yosemite National Park, I stand as a guardian of the uncharted, forever vigilant, and forever seeking answers to the mysteries that lie within the vastness of the unknown. I work for a security company. We install CCTV on construction sites. One night about 2 a.m. our response officer gets a call from the monitoring station to say there's a guy walking around one of the buildings under construction. They described him as tall, 
dressed in all black with his hood up, but couldn't see his face because he had his back to the camera. He wasn't stealing or vandalizing, just wandering around usually homeless looking for shelter. So the response goes to investigate. When he gets there, there's nobody around. So he asks the station to check the camera covering the only way in or out of the building to see which direction he went. Nothing. He does a full patrol of the site and there's no trace of anyone. The only other way for this guy to get out was to shimmy down the scaffolding and he could be hurt so the officer asks the station to do a check on all of the camera footage through the night. Nothing. The next day we asked the station to send over the stills from when they initially picked the intruder up. He's not on any of them. Just footage of our response officer waking around. We were pretty freaked out talking about it in the office, and it was laughed off as the monitoring officer being sleepy and seeing things, except the cameras we use have IR beams, and they only alert the monitoring station when someone breaks them. It was a 2 a.m. type late on a Friday night after a party. Me and her both 18 are at the local state park admiring the moonlight and each other's private parts at the lakeside. I hear slow calculated footsteps behind us. The kind of slow that makes you think someone is trying to hide their approach. I don't remember if it was crunchy leaves or what that gave them away, but I'm just glad I turned around. I look back and see two shadow figures were there, coming towards us from the road and maybe 50 yards away. My car was behind them, and we are definitely the only people in the entire park at this time late at night. I stand up and I say out loud something like, guys, what's up? They don't respond but keep moving towards us until I say to them with a little more tension, stop moving. They stop maybe 30 feet from us and are a little more visible now. One's got a tank top and camo pants, the other has full camo pants and jacket, and what I'm pretty sure was a black paintball mask. Tank top guy starts with, hey guys, sorry, we didn't mean to scare you. Then says they were just noticing my car parked there illegally, and that cops ticket all the time here at night. So I said thank you for letting us know, but then they didn't move. Awkward silence. I said, great, thank you. Again and still nothing except Tank Top tried to talk about parking tickets again. I noticed Paintball Mask had his hands stuffed in his jacket pockets, so I thought it was time to ask him to remove them. Another awkward silence. Of course he didn't, so I asked him again. Another silence. He finally removed them and that was it. The guys walked away and kind of just disappeared into the woods. We ran to our car spooked and couldn't stop checking in the rear view mirror, the whole way out of the park. We checked the computer when we got home and find out all kinds of complaints were being made there about assaults on couples at night. In the 80s there was a serial murderer on couples there too who'd never been caught. All around spooky and until now I have unnecessary laser focus hearing behind me at night. Fifteen years ago, I went camping with two school friends in Bushland that backed onto my dad's property in Wari Yalik, Australia. My dad didn't spend much time at the house, but said we could use it as a base to dump any gear we might not need. He also gave me a heads up that he might creep up to our campsite that night and scare the guys I was with. We hiked from the house for about four hours through very dense bush, where we found a clearing and decided to set up our camp. Looking around the place for firewood, we kept turning up a lot of old bones. Some so old they almost looked like wood. We concluded that due to the land once being used for farming, it was likely they were cow bones. We came up with a few more theories for the sake of scaring each other, then built our fire even burning a couple of the wood-like bones just to see what would happen and settled in. I was woken up by one of my buddies at about 1 a.m. who said he swears he saw torchlight on the tent wall. Excellent, I thought. We sat in silence for a few minutes before the light came back. This was great. I really hammed it up, making up stories about murders in the area and escaped prisoners. The light from the torch fixed on our tent, then switched off. We could hear leaves and sticks moving around outside and my buddies were on the verge of tears. 
Then we started hearing whispering outside, as well as some low mumbling. Dad had brought some friends in on the prank. Dedicated. The torchlight came back on and pressed right up to the tent wall, and a hand began tapping across the top while the whispering continued. My dad had brought some friends in on the prank and convinced them to walk four hours through dense scrub in the middle of the night just to shine a torch on our tent. I started to panic. Then it just stopped completely about an hour after it began. We sat in total silence aside from the sobbing of my buddies, and at dawn packed up and got the F out. We got back to the house and dad was there. He apologized and said he'd planned to come out and see us last night, but fell asleep at his girlfriend's house. We told him about what happened and he was genuinely dumbfounded. Interestingly, I went back to the spot a couple of years ago after telling this story to a friend. We found a small shack made of corrugated iron pockmarked with bullet holes, a 44-gallon drum full of burned clothes, a pile of firewood, and two axes. Who knows if it's related, but it was creepy. Spent a week with a Shure family in the Amazon about 15 miles from Chone, Ecuador. Little background. Three of us gringo medical pre-medical students were staying with them on a medical education rotation, learning about traditional remedies. It was a blast. We stayed in a, in a separate shelter from the family, and the walls of our shelter was decorated with giant snakeskins and tiger skins those beasts that had wandered too close to camp over the years. The jungle is a loud place to sleep. Millions of animals and insects clamor all night long, and it blends into a sort of peaceful cacophony. After the gunshot rang out at 3 a.m., the cacophony was gone. Absolute silence. It was the scariest sound I had ever heard. We clung to my two and knife, telling ourselves that it would protect us from whatever was coming. We cowered across from the entrance to our shelter, awaiting what was to come. Certain a tiger was lurking, or that our lovely hosts had decided they were sick of us. We sat and shivered through the night. The silence was terrifying. When the sun rose and we finally felt confident enough to venture outside. It turned out an unlucky capybara wandered through camp during the night. Poor little bugger got shot in the face at 3 a.m. and was the first meat we had eaten all week by 7 a.m. Tasted like greasy venison. I'll never forget that night or that lovely family. In 28, I was in the Navy. We were 100 plus miles from any land. It was about 3, 4 a.m. off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning on HF, UHF, and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble, followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice reading numbers. 11, 9, 4, 6, etc. This went on for about a minute, then the preamble repeated followed by the same number sequence, then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was to disregard. Creep me right the F out. I came to find out that this is a numbers station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. From May 2010 to May 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20-minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night, and he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I'd think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. 
Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam. It takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m. and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, people could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened, it was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the tail race, and he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped base. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. I was deer hunting on some private land. In back of me was another hunter who had built himself a blind out of straw bales on a slight hill. It was early in the morning when I saw a reddish dog loping at the other end of the field going across our field of view. The stupid idiot started firing his gun at the dog thinking it was a deer. Unfortunately, he was also firing over my head. I could hear the snap of the 30 of six bullets over my head. It was obvious he couldn't hit the ground with his hat, so I carefully moved away from the line of fire. Later that morning crouched in a low dip, some other idiot started firing his gun at something, the bullets rattling the leaves above my head. I was all done after that. Gave my guns to my son and never set a foot in the woods again during deer season. A few years ago, maybe four or five years, I heard a knock on my door. I live in a large apartment complex with a dozen other tenants. Remembering this almost feels like a dream when I try to recall it now. I remember going to the door and opening it up, and there were two men in suits. I want to say they had sunglasses on, but I honestly don't know if that's me just misremembering. Maybe I'm just thinking of the classic men in black scenario, and it's morphing with my actual memory. Either way, I don't remember their features at all, really. But they were definitely in suits. All they did was ask me one question, and it was something like, Hey, does this person live here? Do you know this person? I remember just saying no, and they were like, okay, and I assumed they thanked me and left. As lame as this sounds, I'm actually a bit frazzled as I type this because I know this happened, but I can't remember a lot of it for some reason. Looking back, I'm not sure why I didn't find this more odd or didn't share it with anyone. I don't even know what I'm doing here, but I guess I want to get this memory out somewhere. Thanks for listening. Just the other night, I came home to find one of my mounts had fallen from the wall. Later that night, my IR sensor came unglued from the same wall and fell off. At the time this happened, no one was home and the AC heat was off. I built the house new and moved in about five months ago. The mount was one of the first thing I hung on the wall. It hangs on a half dry wall screw, which was still solid in the wood plank wall backed by three quarters plywood about 12 feet from the floor on an interior wall. The bracket on back of the mount was also good, a little creepy. 
We got to where the first thing we do when we get home is to see if the mount is still on the wall. Not sure if I believe in ghosts, but I have several stories that make me believe there is something going on in the background. I have on several occasions had weird unexplained experiences in several different places. After a while makes you start questioning yourself. I was camping in upstate New York a week after two prisoners escaped. This was a high notoriety escape and was national news. My girlfriend and I had hiked and camped for two days before this. We were very comfortable, had met a lot of awesome people, but everyone was on alert of the escapees. We had settled in, in a remote area upstate New York with no one around that night. I was sound asleep that night. At 5.30 a.m. I had started to awake, but stayed in my tent, not trying to awake, but to maybe go back to sleep for an hour or two. Not long after I was awake did I hear rustling in the woods around our campsite. At first it was a few rustles, which caught my attention, but not enough to be alarmed. Suddenly, the rustles are right outside our tent, and I am on edge. Before I could even tap my girlfriend, all hell breaks loose. My tent is slashed open with a knife while I am watching. My heart almost went through my throat. Before I knew what was happening, I was being pile-driven into the ground by men with guns. Thankfully, I had noticed in the seconds that the men had police armor on. I started screaming out my name, my address, my social security number. Everything. My girlfriend was even jumped on and forcefully subdued while she was sleeping. Once everyone's adrenaline calmed down, we showed our IDs and proved we were just camping. It was one of the scariest moments of my life, and also for the police officers that subdued us. Turns out we were not far from where they were just spotted, and the police hadn't come across anyone in days. They had thought for sure they had come upon the escapees' camp. Two deputy sheriffs believe that they have seen a tall, dark figure just outside the city limits of Oceanside, California. They both stated that they were viewing this creature standing on the other side of an eight-foot-tall chain-link fence. The officers state they saw it moving its head back and forth, as if looking around at the area. This is when one of the deputies decides to go get his light for more illumination. When he returned, he says that whatever it was on the other side of the fence had moved off into some bushes out of sight range, leaving him with no idea of what he had just witnessed. Another sighting comes from two teenagers who were driving alongside Beach Boulevard in Oceanside on the 14th. They spotted what they thought was a bear on the side of the road, but this soon proved to be incorrect. One of the teens stated that he got out his light, shined it at the thing, only to find that there were no eyes. This is when they both ran back to their car and took off in fear, not wanting to see any more. During November of 2012, there had also been numerous UFO sightings all across California. Could these so-called sightings be related somehow? People are always reporting strange lights over cities here in America. What makes these reports any different? What do you think about all these weird happenings taking place today? Is this some sort of warning or sign for humans? Or are people simply making these up because we're desperate for attention? They went on to mention that there were several people that had filed reports of tall, dark figures in the area. They also stated that they were not sure if these incidents were connected, but it seems highly possible since they occurred on the same day. Now, our final report comes from yet another deputy from Graham County, Arizona. He states that while he was on duty around 3 in the morning, he heard a very strange noise coming from outside this location. When he went to investigate what the sound could have been, he says there was a tall, dark figure standing out there in front of him, near an old abandoned meat facility. What makes this sighting even more interesting is that this site was surrounded by open fields and little else. There is no way possible for somebody to hide out there. So what was this thing doing just standing there, staring at the deputy? When asked why he didn't do anything to apprehend it or even fire upon it, he said that he felt paralyzed with fear. He claims that his mind was telling him one thing, but his body would simply not listen. This is when he went back inside the building, calling for backup. 
When other deputies arrived on location, they could find no sign of any type of activity taking place. There were also no footprints found near the fence line or anywhere else throughout the dirt road leading up to where this creature had been seen standing. Imagine living in a world where you fear everything around you. You never know if something is lurking in the shadows or waiting for its next victim. Those are the people who have to live with this kind of anxiety all the time. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to live in a world where every dark corner could hold some unseen danger? What if there was something out there that was watching every move, hiding when needed, only to return once again when you least expect it, to strike without any warning? These are just some questions that many individuals could ask themselves whenever they hear stories about strange sightings taking place somewhere in or near their own city. Every day somebody else is coming forward, claiming that they have seen something out of this world or not quite human in appearance. Whether these claims are true or not is anybody's guess at this point. But what if one day, whatever is hiding in the shadows decides that we are not the ones who should be living on this planet anymore? That is a very deep and creepy thought to ponder about during one's downtime. Hopefully, these stories of strange encounters will just turn out to be lurking in the shadows and not actually be true. I was one of the naval officers fortunate enough to serve near Key West, where our days were filled with maritime duties and the constant vigilance that comes with protecting our nation's waters. It was a day like any other, with the sun casting its golden rays upon the endless expanse of ocean before us. As our motor launch smoothly cut through the gentle waves, our attention was abruptly captured by a sight that defied all reason. Suspended above the water, gleaming in the sunlight, was a cigar-shaped object unlike anything we had ever encountered. It hovered there, a silent enigma against the backdrop of the vast blue horizon. The bewilderment that gripped our hearts was soon interrupted by the arrival of a fighter plane, seemingly materializing out of thin air. With a swift maneuver, it darted toward the unidentified object, causing it to retreat into the heavens, vanishing in mere seconds. The abrupt departure left us stunned, our minds racing to comprehend the inexplicable events that had just unfolded before our eyes. Our motor launch eventually returned to the safety of the dock, the weight of our encounter weighing heavily upon our minds. To our astonishment, as soon as we disembarked, we found ourselves surrounded by a group of men clad in dark suits. Their presence exuded an air of authority, their steely gazes leaving little room for doubt. They swiftly took control of the situation, subjecting us to an interrogation that felt more like an attempt to discredit us than to seek the truth. Hours passed, filled with probing questions and skeptical glances, as if our accounts were nothing more than figments of an overactive imagination. The men in dark suits seemed determined to cast doubt upon our credibility, painting our remarkable experience as a fabrication or a misinterpretation of natural phenomena. The weight of their skepticism grew heavier with each passing moment, their relentless pursuit of discrediting our claims becoming more apparent. We were left to wonder, why were they so eager to silence our voices? What was it about our encounter that threatened their carefully constructed narratives? The truth remained tantalizingly out of reach, hidden behind a veil of secrecy and doubt. Though we were released from their clutches, their questioning left an indelible mark upon our memories. We were left with more questions than answers, forever haunted by the enigma that had unfolded over the waters near Key West. In the years that followed, we shared our story with those willing to listen, knowing that the truth deserved to be heard. We refused to let our voices be silenced, determined to shed light on the extraordinary events that unfolded before our eyes. To this day, the memory of that hovering object and the subsequent interrogation lingers within us, a testament to the profound mysteries that lie just beyond the veil of what we consider to be reality. And though our credibility may have been questioned, our conviction remains unyielding, reminding us that some truths are meant to be known, regardless of the attempts to suppress them. I must preface this story by assuring you that every word I'm about to share is true. It was an unimaginable thing that I, Jake, 
a father of two girls and an occasional outdoorsman, experienced deep in the heart of a remote mountain town near Texas. This is a story of a hunting trip gone horribly wrong, where my companions and I faced an unimaginable terror. It all began when a group of 11 seasoned hunters, including myself, gathered in the rustic town. The crisp autumn air carried whispers of elusive elk roaming the treacherous wilderness. Determined to conquer the challenge, we set out on an expedition to a hidden, unmarked location deep within the woods. As we trekked further into the wilderness, excitement coursed through our veins. However, our enthusiasm quickly waned as our compass inexplicably malfunctioned. The needle spun aimlessly, leaving us disoriented and vulnerable. A sense of unease settled upon us, as if unseen eyes were watching our every move. Undeterred, we pushed forward, relying on our instincts and experience. But the woods grew denser, and an eerie silence enveloped the landscape. Branches creaked underfoot, and the rustling of leaves seemed to echo with an otherworldly presence. Suddenly, chaos erupted. We scattered, separated by the onslaught of an enormous creature that emerged from the shadows. Towering and powerful, it resembled a beastly figure akin to Bigfoot, but far more menacing in stature. Panic gripped our souls as it hunted us down, one by one, with ruthless efficiency. I fought for my life with every ounce of strength and survival instinct I possessed. In a fierce battle, I managed to best the creature, but the victory was hollow. As its life force dissipated, it inexplicably evaporated, leaving only a pile of bones as a haunting testament to its existence. Bloodied and battered, I emerged as the sole survivor of the harrowing encounter. Determined to escape this hellish nightmare, I pressed on, searching for any sign of civilization. Exhaustion threatened to consume me as I wandered aimlessly through the dense foliage. And then, as if guided by some unseen force, I stumbled upon a surreal sight hidden within the woods, a set of stairs, seemingly out of place amidst the natural surroundings. Driven by desperation, I climbed those stairs, not knowing what lay ahead. To my astonishment, as I reached the top, I found myself standing in the very camp where our ill-fated journey began. It was a maddening realization, a loop in the fabric of reality itself. Time had folded in on itself, leading me back to the origin of our doomed expedition. Now, burdened with the knowledge of the horrors that unfolded in those woods, I find myself haunted by questions that may never be answered. What was the true nature of that creature? How did those stairs appear in the heart of the wilderness? Is this all just a cruel twist of fate? This story serves as a warning to those who dare venture into the unknown, for there are forces lurking in the depths of the wild that defy comprehension. As for me, I carry the weight of this experience, forever marked by the inexplicable events that transpired in that remote Texas town. My brother and I decided to go on a sailing trip. We're both Marines, so we don't get to see each other often. We made camp on a small island with a decently sized patch of trees. At 2 a.m. or so, we heard a boat coming towards us. Our fire had died down, but was still visible. This was a remote area, so it felt off that someone would be coming to our campsite. We grabbed our weapons and quietly went into the tree line. Some scraggly looking guy started rifling through our shit, then started walking toward our boat with a rope. I decided to confront him, and my brother stayed back. To alert this stranger to my presence, I pumped my shotgun and asked him what the hell he was doing in our camp. Before this guy could say anything, I heard another guy in the darkness beyond the fire scream for me to drop my gun, or he would kill me. Before I could react, my brother opened fire on the second guy, and I shot the first guy. I retreated back to the tree line, and my brother asked if I was good. I told him I was all right. We did a perimeter sweep, gathered our shit, and destroyed, sank their boat. When we got back to shore, we contacted the state police and told them what happened. They detained us until our story could be cleared, then released us. So glad we decided to go together, or there's a good chance one of us could have been killed. Edit. To clarify, both died after being shot. 
we sank the boat in case there were any others that hid after the initial confrontation to avoid being followed. We didn't take their boat because that would have looked really bad if we got stopped on our way back my brother and I were detained until our story could be verified. Once the evidence was gathered and processed, we were released. We found out the men had been convicted of assault and burglary multiple times. We were never charged with anything, but sought legal counsel in case it did happen. To those messaging me saying I'm a coward or murderer, put yourself in the situation we were in. A stranger comes to our camp, starts stealing, and when confronted, his accomplice threatened to kill me and leveled a weapon at me. I shot because I didn't know how many others my brother might be dealing with, and I wasn't going to turn my back to someone who clearly meant harm. In the context of the situation, it was threat non-threat. In this report, I wish to remain completely anonymous. I'm a police officer and I had a sighting of a strange humanoid werewolf looking creature while patrolling a rural section of Baxter County, Arkansas. Another officer had spotted the creature at a four-way stop and I was sent to investigate. When I arrived at the location, the peculiar looking humanoid emerged and started walking across one of the roads, disappearing quickly into the nearby brush. As it turns out, this area has a long history of werewolf-type activity, along with unexplained animal deaths and disappearances. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to assess the creature's size before it vanished into the wooded area. I conducted a search of the location and found several sets of tracks on the dirt roads, but due to recent rainfall, they were not clear enough to determine what might have been responsible. This report is the only official complaint from an officer thus far although other officers from the same department have come forward to share their knowledge of the area. One officer even mentioned that his own grandfather had told him about a werewolf-like creature living in this vicinity. Due to its remote location, very few people ever venture there, and there had been no other reports until now. Since then, a string of stories about strange and disturbing creatures has emerged from around the world. Some reports, including those on sites like Reddit, mentioned sightings of werewolf-like creatures. While this is not a new phenomenon, as there have been reports of such beings for centuries in America, one incident stood out among the others. The incident involved a mother and child who witnessed what they believed to be a Bigfoot near their home just outside of town. They managed to position themselves with a camera and started recording. What followed would be familiar to those who have seen werewolves before. The description given resembled a dog or wolf suffering from mange, which causes hair loss and other physical ailments. However, there was an important note, the apparent foul smell emitted by this sickly looking animal. Yes, dogmen, Bigfoot and werewolves have all been associated with strong odors, and this particular sighting seemed highly likely, considering the location. Similar sightings have been reported in these parts, and the locals are aware of what they might be encountering. Another report involved two separate officers, each with their own stories about encounters while patrolling this specific part of Arkansas. Most of these encounters took place at night, and although there is little information available about them, witnesses commonly describe the creatures as being around five to six feet tall, gaunt, and thin. Glowing eyes are also frequently mentioned, which seems to be a common characteristic among these types of encounters. One officer shared that while in the same area, he observed something moving swiftly into the trees. At first, he thought it might be an animal, but then he heard another report over his radio about a Bigfoot sighting nearby. This proximity unsettled him, making him uncertain about what he had truly witnessed. In yet another report, a pilot flying his small plane around 5 a.m. encountered what appeared to be a massive, hairy creature. Several other pilots in the rural region of Arkansas had also spotted it. According to the officer, residents of these areas have been sharing stories for years about encountering these strange creatures, and some claim to know people who hunt them. Among the most intriguing encounters, I found one involving a police officer from Cowling County. He responded to an animal complaint near the town of De Quincey one evening. 
As he arrived at the scene, he saw two sets of eyes peering from behind a nearby tree, emitting an extremely bright glow. This was his first sighting of what he believed to be a huge canine-like creature. However, when it opened its mouth and let out an otherworldly growl, he backed away in fear. The officer described the creature as approximately eight feet tall, covered in dark, smoky fur. Lastly, the final sighting occurred on Highway 165 near Wilmer, where another officer had responded to a call about children claiming to have seen a Bigfoot or werewolf-like figure. According to their description, this entity had very long arms, hands resembling those of a raccoon or a human, and it was enough to frighten the officer away from the scene. At that time, I was a Presbyterian minister, visiting the bustling city of Chicago with my young son. Our purpose for being there was to explore the wonders of the Museum of Science and Industry, a place that promised to ignite our imaginations and inspire our curiosity. Little did we know that our visit would take an unexpected turn into the realms of mystery and intrigue. As we navigated the labyrinthine corridors of the museum, Marveling at the exhibits that unfolded before our eyes, we inadvertently strayed from the well-trodden path. The hallway seemed to twist and turn, leading us deeper into the heart of the building, away from the familiar attractions that drew the attention of other visitors. Lost in this maze of unfamiliar territory, we stumbled upon a room that seemed out of place, as if it existed in a different dimension from the rest of the museum. The air hung heavy with an aura of secrecy and anticipation. Our eyes were drawn to a large glass case that stood in the center, its contents obscured by a veil of curiosity. As we approached the case, our senses tingling with anticipation, we were confronted by a sight that defied explanation. Within the glass enclosure lay small humanoid bodies, their forms eerily preserved for all eternity. They possessed a delicate fragility, Yet their presence emanated an otherworldly energy that sent shivers down our spines. Before we could fully process the gravity of what we were witnessing, a group of men descended upon us, their purpose as enigmatic as the beings encased in glass. They demanded my immediate attention, forcibly guiding me to a secluded corner of the room. Papers were thrust before me, demanding my signature without explanation or respite. Fear mingled with confusion as I complied, their stern gazes leaving no room for defiance. I was granted no opportunity to question or resist. The ordeal was over as abruptly as it had begun, and we were allowed to leave, the weight of secrecy heavy upon my conscience. Confounded by the enigmatic encounter, my young son and I departed the museum, carrying with us a story that defied conventional explanation. Years later, in 1974, my son, now grown, recounted the bizarre incident to Shern Larson of the Center for UFO Studies. The memories resurfaced, a reminder of the extraordinary circumstances we had encountered within the Museum of Science and Industry. The details were etched in our minds, forever ingrained in our family's history. To this day, the questions linger. What was the significance of those small humanoid bodies? Who were those men that compelled me to sign those mysterious papers? The answers remain elusive, hidden within the depths of an enigma that continues to captivate the imagination of those willing to explore the uncharted realms of possibility. On March 22, 2013, I, Officer Mike Milner, was checking out a report of missing livestock in the area around Lukachukai, Arizona. I joined Navajo officers in the search and investigation, hoping to find some clues as to where the animals had been taken. We couldn't find any dead animals initially, but Officer Larry Wanuka soon discovered heavy footprints that belonged to a single set of tracks. These tracks led us towards a valley nestled between two close-together cliffs, and there we found the gruesome scene where the animals had been killed and taken their throats ripped open and tongues removed. I decided to climb up into one of the cliff areas, armed with my rifle, keeping watch for any signs of more of these creatures. What happened next was truly astonishing. I later shared the experience exclusively with cryptozoologists, recalling how, while I was at my post, I heard the sound of something large approaching. 
I couldn't see anything, but I kept hearing it get closer and closer, I recounted. I turned on my light and saw a towering, dark figure about 15 to 20 feet away. It was huge, yet its features were indistinct, no eyes, no mouth, just plain skin covering its body. It was completely naked, devoid of any identifiable gender characteristics. Before I could react, the being swiftly darted away. It was just a crazy moment. I've been working in this area for about 10 years now, and I've never heard of or seen anything like that, I added. While I mentioned the notion of skinwalkers, I must admit that I don't believe it was one. However, my knowledge of Navajo mythology and folklore is limited. Nevertheless, my department chief seems to have an idea about the identity of the creature we encountered, referring to a specific shaman. Initially, we laughed it off, I concluded. But after witnessing what this entity did to our animals, there's no doubt in my mind that it exists. It's worth noting that skinwalkers have long been a topic of speculation. While many Navajo people believe in them, state and law enforcement officials often remain skeptical. Back in 29, a viral video supposedly showing an upright walking figure stirred intrigue. It marked the first time an officer had such a close encounter with one of these creatures. In 2011, the FBI released documents about skinwalkers, but they were largely dismissed and never gained traction in the mainstream media. These leaked documents are now nearly impossible to find. When contacted, the Navajo Nation Police Department, or NNPD, offered no comment on the story. They seem to be extremely cautious about what they choose to publicize and respond to, likely aiming to downplay any rumors or accusations. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.